using all the fire exits to go up and down. Uh, look, it's been great that we've had this amazing turnout. Uh, we're going to continue on while the other breakouts come, uh, uh, are, are, are moving in here as well as we wrap the day up. Uh, one of the things we really wanted to do at the very end here was bring up uh, somebody who's a well-regarded speaker in the industry, spends a lot of time with uh, uh, events like TED Talks and, and Wired and uh, TechCrunch. It has a really amazing perspective on kind of the business, macro business major transformation drivers that are going on because a lot of what we're doing with robots you know, whether in the background or maybe even in the front office, you know, have a lot to do with these amazing uh, industry trends. So it's my pleasure to welcome managing partner of Amex Ventures, Scott Amex. Thank you. So, so the nice thing about ex expecting 250 people or so and getting over 500 people is that the energy level is exciting. It is, you can sense it, it's tingling. The bad side is after this session, when you go to get your appetizers and cocktails, there's only gonna be half the portion. <laughs> so you'll need to buddy up and just eat half of what you've been allocated. Um, I uh, recently, moved, and uh, my wife has given me some honeydews. She said, honey, this house would be fantastic if you put in some crown moldings over there, and oh, I envisioned this porch and a deck. And then I said, hon, you do know that I don't even know what a miter saw is, right? Uh, I'm the guy that doesn't quite know how to measure things. Angles are a little bit hard for me. Uh, geometry is not my best thing. But automation, in particularly, digital transformation is very much like that, in the sense that it's daunting. You look at this thing and you're like, wow, do I have the right tools? Do I have the right skills? Do I have the right capabilities? And what if I do a bad job? Because I know that I'm going to end up in the garage for sure. But as an organization, we can't afford to do that. Uh, people often ask me, won't automation take away human jobs? And here's my answer to that question. Do you know what the greatest thing about email is? It's the fact that email has obliviated licking stamps. Let me explain. Christmas is coming around the corner, right? And it used to be just a few years ago, I remember creating a stack of Christmas cards. And then lo and behold, guess who gets stuck with licking the stamps? It was me. So my personal slogan when it comes to automation is that Automation helps get rid of licking the stamps so that you can focus on the things that matter to you. Now, all of you as executives are under incredible pressure every day from all of these external as well as internal forces to reduce costs, increase revenue, increase market share, and it's coming from all direction. A matter of fact, earlier this year, Avon products pushed out their CEO, Sharon McCoy, because she wasn't turning around the company fast enough. But let me ask you, do you think this story was an isolated case? It's not. CEO turnover rate is at all-time high. Matter of fact, according to Booz, now part of PwC, 17% of the globe's largest public companies have forced their CEOs to leave, one way or another. And there's even ethical issues as well. Now the thing is, most of these CEOs many times know what's happening in terms of performance as well as some of the ethical issues that's underlying these issues. But yet, there are legitimate cases where the leadership are completely blindsided. Why? Because they didn't see it coming. 
it was a handful of rogue people that were doing something with fake accounts, let's say. So what does automation do in this situation? It helps with compliance, transparency, accountability, and meets the demands of Wall Street. Now, in my travels around the world, I talk about digital transformation, not just for organizations in terms of companies, but for nations. And I can tell you that when I talk to them, they look at me with this deer in the headlights look as if, how in the world am I going to make this happen? Because when you see exponential technologies like AI, like robotics, like quantum computing, decentralized computing, and so forth, it is daunting. Moreover, many of you in your firms have already engaged consulting firms like the McKinsey and Bain and Accenture and Deloitte that you saw today. And they have told you pretty much more or less the same message. Your company has to become more digitized in order to avoid being a commoditized business and losing market share. That is a reality that we live in. Matter of fact, there is even a metric called the digital quotient that measures the digital maturity of an organization. The point is very simple. Digitization gives organization a major leg up. You can see that on the top right. It enables your organization to use and manage your assets, processes, and labor more efficiently to increase productivity and outputs. Now, one of these digitization trends, of course, is AI. And AI is often referred to as electricity of the fourth industrial revolution. And there's some incredible promising figures like that, $1.1 trillion. And on a global scale, we're looking at 0 0.8 to 1.4% increase across the entire world in terms of productivity growth from things like AI and robotics. But here's the deal. For AI to work, you need data and lots of data. More specifically, the three Vs, volume, variety, and velocity. And that's where Internet of Things come in. It allows for a quantification of your entire value chain on a real-time basis to feed those algorithms that are so hungry in order for it to do its work. Now, IoT is expected to reach some $11 trillion in economic value by 2025. And that's just, just around the corner. And just like AI, it is a massive opportunity. But if you look on the bottom right, on the third column, you can see that very few are in full deployment, meaning that they're still in proof of concept. So here's the reality. The reality check is that the allure of AI and IoT are compelling, no doubt. But after conferences like this, that's energetic and exciting. But when you go back to your organizations and you do your introspection with your colleagues, you realize that you're not ready for prime time. Questions come up, such as, does it mean that we have to sunset some of our legacy systems? Do we need to invest millions of dollars to create new data architecture and infrastructure? Do we have to change our business processes? Will our employees resist the change? Do they even have the right skills and capabilities? Or do we need to hire an army of data scientists, AI engineers, or depend on some expensive outside consultancy perpetually? Let me share a story about compatibility. In 1954, there was a doctor named Dr. Joseph Murray. And he successfully removed the kidney from one human patient to another and actually successfully implement, I implanted it without that body rejecting that foreign organ. Now, his success had to do more with not just an innovative surgical procedure, but the fact that he focused on compatibility, compatibility. You see, Dr. Murray 
what he did was he purposefully chose a pair of identical twins. One was Ronald Henrik and his terminally ill brother, Richard Henrik. And he hoped that their similar genetic makeup would reduce the likelihood of that body rejecting that kidney. Now, of course, we have new drugs that helps with some of these issues in terms of organ transplants. But the point is that no matter how great that technology is, unless you and your organizations can adapt and embrace in a way that your company's IT processes and the people don't reject them, it's not going to work. So the question becomes, how do you as an organization cross that chasm? By the way, uh, if you haven't been there, you have to go. It's incredible. He's been there. But so the, the nice thing is no matter where your legacy status, your current state, there is actually a way to cross over from that desired state, I mean cross over from that current state to that desired state. And let me explain how. RPA, as you've heard all day today, can help improve business processes and increase the effectiveness and do it in a faster and a lower cost manner than the current methods. And it doesn't introduce incredible change because you're simply automating the things that we do manually. I remember when my daughter was seven, I was the uh, first time we actually took her bowling. And she was so excited, she didn't know what bowling was. And we went to the bowling alley, and then there were all these balls, and of course, all the balls are too heavy for her. So we gave her the smallest ball, and then of course, we had those bumpers up. Well, we finished the game, and then came home, and she was unusually quiet, too quiet. And then suddenly she started to just bawl, and then tears just ran down like Niagara Falls. And after half an hour, she said, Dad, I didn't bowl 300. It's a true story, not making it up. Sometimes as organizations, we read these analyst reports, and you see in all of them today, right? And our consultants tells us that if we don't adopt these new shiny things, such as AI, that we're going to miss out. But you see, implementing AI is more than just consuming API services using libraries or SDKs. So you see, on your side, there are a lot of organizational change, structural, financial, mindset changes to come that has to be overcome, right? RDA and RPA are realistic solutions with high return on investment that get you closer to the promise of digital transformation so that you can cross over. Now I'm going to share a little case study because not too long ago, certainly not in my lifetime, but in terms of human civilization, there was also a time where it was electrifying. Uh, like I mentioned before, AI is often referred to as the electricity of the fourth industrial revolution. But in order to capitalize on AI, it's more than just about implementing algos. It has similarities to the early days of electricity. Let me explain. As magical as electricity was when it was first, in, first invented, it needed economies of scale to make it available to everyone. It was daunting, it was expensive, it was transformational. Thomas Edison, as most of you know, um, not only harnessed electricity, but he actually did one of the smartest things as a business person. He hired a young 21-year-old Samuel Insull in 1881. Now, while Edison focused on the inventions, Samuel focused on everything else. And you could say that Samuel was really the one that made electricity into an industry. You see, electricity was fundamentally different from any other product prior to that date. Electricity had to be consumed immediately, the moment that it was produced. 
And in, for, in order for electricity to become accessible and affordable, they need to bring it together in such a mass efficient efficiency across production and consumption. So Insel was the one that saw this opportunity. And he's the one that started to build modern power grids to achieve those economies of scale. He consolidated smaller electricity providers. And you start to use larger, more efficient generators. And you also saw efficiencies in the volume of customers. The more customers, the more efficient. And you could lower the price of electricity. He even went as far as building out high voltage transmission lines to spread electricity to the suburbs and to the countryside. And if you look at this chart, this chart, believe it or not, though it talks about electricity, it's not that different from where we're going to be headed with AI. And ultimately, ultimately, thanks to RPA. You see, just like the electrical transformation, digital transformation isn't easy. It's complex. It's messy. It's costly. And it's about people change as much as, as much as it's about technology change. RPA provides the economies of scale. It brings down the cost structure to automate and to digitize so they can move closer to that AI and that transformation that you're looking for. Like I said, AI is more than just algorithms, NLP, ML, neural networks, deep learning. It's more than that. It's about creating an ecosystem. It requires heavy investments, new skills, new capabilities, new approaches. RPA is a path forward without the risk of heavy CapEx or uncertain outcomes. Never before has the expected return been so certain that the risk profile is so well mitigated. And as your organization's internal champions, and that's why you decided to attend today's conference, you have the opportunity to bring your enterprise closer to that aspirational goal of digitization. RPA, based on what you've heard today and what you've experienced, has a real tangible potential to bring significant win, not only for your organization, but for you personally. With the microeconomics well laid out, it is time to scale. So thank you very much. I'm so excited to be here and enjoy the rest of the day. And remember to share your appetizers.